pardon? The Lord, that is what I'm going to. The Lord is with them. Thank you. Everything else is true, but that is what I am going to. Let's look in the scriptures. And I'd like you to please turn with me. We're going to put some of these scriptures up. 2 Kings 18, verse 5 to 7. Second Kings 18, verse 5 to 7. This is talking about Hezekiah. He was one of the lineage of David, one of the kings in David's lineage. Because there are lots of scriptures, if you're not able to turn to it as quickly, never mind. Either you see it up there or write down the passage. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. He kept the commands of the Lord. The Lord had given Moses and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. Now this is a a king. 1 Samuel 3.19 1 Samuel 3.19. This time, this is talking about a prophet who's also a leader. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. Can we read that all together again? So we see the Lord was with him. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and he let none of his words fall to the ground. Daniel chapter 4, verse 8. How many here have read the book of Daniel over and over again? I find Daniel exemplary. I find him someone that really honored God. You know, it was a terrible thing in those days when Israel was being punished by God because they had departed from the Lord and they took them as exiles and they were made eunuchs. Do you know who eunuchs are? They're castrated. It was a painful thing. No anesthesia. And Daniel did not allow that suffering to derail him from God. And all these people, Daniel and the, all the, let me read the first, before we read this one, Daniel 4, 8, let me read the first few verses here. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was a brilliant king. He knew that if I'm going to change the society of Israel, I need to get the young people the young, bright, sharp people. I need to get them and I need to indoctrinate them with my own ideas and change their way of thinking because they will change generations to come. I'm reading from verse 3. You don't need to put it up because I'm still going to this one. From verse 3 of chapter 1. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they will enter the king's service. And so, some of us may know the story, some of us may not, but Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these Israelites, they were amongst those that were taken, and they decided that we don't don't want the king's delicacies. We're not going to pollute ourselves with the king's, the delicacies from the king's table. And they besought the people over them that, please, just give us vegetables, And observe and see whether in 10 days, if we're going to be better looking, more nourished than our contemporaries. And they were. And so they took away the king's portion from them. And at the end of the three years, when they faced Nebuchadnezzar, God had blessed these three, these four. And they were found to be 10 times better than their pairs. Now, over and over again, we'll see Daniel. There's a time when Nebuchadnezzar had his first dream. 
and he called all the astrologers and wise men and said, okay, I had a dream. I want you to tell me the dream and I want you to tell me the meaning. And they were like, oh, blessed are you, O king. Tell us your dream, we'll tell you the meaning. And he said, I'm serious. If you don't tell me the dream and tell me the meaning, your heads are going to be lopped off. I'm going to tear you from limb to limb. And they were like, there is no God. There is nobody that has ever asked such a thing. Nobody can do that. In fact, it's only the gods that can tell a man his dream, and they don't live among men. So Nebuchadnezzar got really angry, and he sent his um, henchmen to go and kill all the wise men of the kingdom. When they got to Daniel, because Daniel was in this category with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he spoke with Ariok with wisdom and asked that, what's going on? Why is the king giving such a severe order? And Ariok told him. So he asked for some time. And then he called his th three friends and asked, that, let's pray that God would have mercy and spare us and reveal it to us. So in a nutshell, God revealed the dream to, to Daniel and the meaning. And they were spared. And from Nebuchadnezzar, there are several things that happened from Nebuchadnezzar through to the reign of, Belteshia, of Belteshazzar, through to the reign of Darius and Cyrus. Daniel remained consistent in serving God. Now, in Daniel 4, 8, this was a time when Nebuchadnezzar had a different dream about a tree. And by now, Daniel had a reputation of having the spirit of God. So in verse 8, he says, I'll start from verse 7. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar. So, sorry, the other king is Belshazzar. He's called Belteshazzar after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. This is a non-Christian in his, the way he can, the way he is able to express it. He acknowledges that there's something supernatural. The spirit of the gods is in this person. The spirit of God was in Daniel. Let's look at Genesis 39, verse 2 to 6. Now I'm going to Joseph. And there's only one person in contemporary society that I know of that went from prison to being a prime minister. Who's that? Who? Yes, Mandela. In Bible times, that happened with Joseph. But what I want us to trace is whether Joseph was in Potiphar's house, whether Joseph was in prison, or when he became prime minister, what was the common phrase with him? The Lord was with him. I want you to notice that with every, it didn't matter the sphere of influence, the sphere of leadership, king, prophet, prime minister, the characteristic of their lives is the Lord is with them. You can be gifted. You can be charismatic and the world recognizes it. You can be intelligent. You have a lot of smarts. It does not cut it in God's kingdom because God can raise up a donkey and God can make a donkey wiser than you. God can raise up anything. Jesus said, if these children don't praise me, God can raise up stones to praise me. But is God with you? Is the spirit of God in you? This is what counts. And so the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered and he lived in the house of the, his Egyptian master. That was when, and let me read it in my version because it's quite, it's touching when you see how from prison, from Potiphar's house to prison, they always made him in charge and they didn't concern themselves with anything once Joseph was in charge. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. In verse 21, we see that, but while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. 
He showed him kindness and he granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those that were held in prison and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention again to anything under Joseph's care because, because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in everything he did. And then in chapter 41, after he was called to Pharaoh, we see Pharaoh asked, so can we find anyone like this man? One in whom the spirit of God is. When the spirit of God is in you, there is a difference. It is very different from charisma. It is very different. You cannot, you can't imitate it. You can't counterfeit the presence of God in your life. And remember, it starts from when you're not known by people because it's not about being known. No. The Bible says Enoch walked with God and he was not. God took him away. We don't have many Bible verses on Enoch, but he was dear to God's heart. And he's one of the people that left this life without suffering death. So he's not someone, it's not about being popular. It's not about being known. And you know, one of the things that was pointed out yesterday night that I think it's very important for every believer to keep in mind is you can pursue fame in the church. In other words, your motive is wrong. I want to be it, but you're doing it through, I want to be in leadership so I can be the one that is known. Self-glory, we have to be careful. But start where you are to honor God, to pursue the Lord and have his presence in your life so that wherever it is, whether he's having you in prison or he's having you in Potiphar's house or he's having you as a prime minister, the Lord is with you. That is what matters in this life. And then Joshua I won't read the scriptures. I'm just going to tell you about this one. Joshua, remember he was at first an army general and then he was Moses' successor. And again, in Joshua 6, 27, it tells us that the Lord was with Joshua as well. You can put up the scripture as well, even though I won't be reading it. It tells us God was with Joshua as well. New Testament, John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, the only person the Bible records that was, what happened with him from the womb? He was baptized with the Holy Spirit from the womb. That's right. And so the hallmark of a leader, a biblical leader that is a leader under Christ, is that the Lord is with you, the Lord is in you. Even our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was going to start his ministry and he came to be baptized in the Jordan, what happened? Pardon? Anyone? So that we can hear you, yes. Yes, thank you. The heavens opened up, the Spirit of God descended on him in the form of a dove, and the Lord attested, the God the Father attested to him that this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So even the, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God was upon him our Lord and our Savior. What distinguishes you, where you are now, whether you're in a leadership position or not, what distinguishes you? What makes you distinct? Is it that the presence of God is in you? Is that what, what sets you apart? If you set, come, up, come out from sin, if you come out from things that don't please God and you separate yourself, God says, I will dwell in you. I will dwell with you. The gifts come. They would, the whole, when you're like that, when you're separate unto God, God gives you the enablement. Don't worry about that. But seek to have the presence of God. Then there are a few other things that I want to touch on. How do you invite the presence of God into your life? How do you welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit? Henry David Trusser, he's an American philosopher, and there's something he said that's now one, is one of the idioms that we hear in literature. He said, if a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it's because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music which he hears, however measured or far away. Have you ever heard that saying, 
are you marching to the beat of a different drum beat, to the beat uh, of a different drummer? Anybody heard that idiom before? You know what it means. Now, in the context in which I'm using it, as a leader in Christ, a potential leader in Christ, you are to match to a different drummer, to a different drum beat than the drum beat of the world. Or even institutionalized church, because there's a lot, it's sad, but there's a lot of politics in church. There's a lot of, um, as, you, as you guys stay in the faith and stay, you'll find that it's not always, you're really blessed to have the leadership you have in Brajaj and Saudi, but you find that there's a lot of corruption Institutional, in institutionalized church. But what I'm talking about is marching to the drumbeat of Jesus Christ. He is the one to dictate what, how you dance. You listen to the melody of heaven and you follow through with that. So what, what are the um, highlights? What do you do to welcome the presence of God to march to that drumbeat? Let's open Mark 1.35. Mark chapter 1 verse 35. And it says about Jesus that a great while before day, Jesus went to a solitary place and there he prayed. This is our Savior communing with God the Father. Over and over again, you will find it in scripture that after he's had a busy day talking to people from the mountaintop, he will send his disciples on and then he will withdraw to a place and there he will commune with his Father. If God the son needed that. How much more you and me? No matter how busy we are, if you really believe Jesus is your lifeline, you will spend time with him daily. The way we just get up and go, you know, ah, I woke up late. I can't spend time with God today. And we just go into our day. It shows that we don't have a real sense of how dependent we really are on God. But if you are going to be a leader in which the spirit of God dwells, who's air marked by the presence of God, you cannot toy with communion with God. Secondly, you surround yourself with godly friends. What does that proverb say? Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with the wise will be wise. Thank you. Daniel was very wise. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he chose his friends wisely. He chose friends that would be able to say, when they had to, when they stood before the statue, remember when Nebuchadnezzar put his statue up and they said, if you don't fall down and worship this statue, you're going into the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to give you one more chance. Because they had come to report Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to him that they weren't bowing down. And he said, I'll give you one more chance. This time, when you hear the sound of the musical instrument, bow down. Oh. They said, we don't, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. The God we serve, he can deliver us. If he chooses not to, still low, we won't bow down to this statue. And Nebuchadnezzar was very angry. You remember the story? And he called his henchmen again. Come, come, come. Hit it seven times hotter. Throw them in. And they called the heftiest men to throw them in. And they threw those three in. And the men who threw them in, what happened to those men? They died. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, Nebuchadnezzar went and he said, eh, 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 eh. Did we not throw three people? What is this? I see four people walking in, and the fourth person is like the Son of God. This is a heathen king, and Jesus was there with them. And when they walked out of the fire, they didn't even smell of smoke. Not their hair, not a single strand was singed. Daniel chose his friends wisely. Choose your friends carefully. They influence you. I remember, if I'm going up the stairs, it's much easier for you to pull me down than for me to pull you up. So if you want to be a leader that is characterized by God's presence, choose your friends wisely. Now, there's another point that I'm going to go to that is very important. Listen to advice and correction. But George told you, um, Star, oh, Auntie Oye and I go way back. We're roommates in 86. I'm sorry to say we have friends 
who were vibrant in college like us, and they've turned away from the faith now. That was 1986, we're in 2013. We're talking to you now, not just for here. We're talking to you for the long haul, for a lifetime. We have colleagues who have passed on, who have gone to glory. We have colleagues that were the firebrands in fellowship that don't talk to them about Jesus today. So we're talking to you about the long haul. You understand what I'm saying? Listen, have a teachable spirit to listen to correction and advice. You know what God does in each one of our lives? God brings people into our lives who can hold the mirror up for you. What do I mean by holding the mirror up for you? Yes. Let's say I have a smear here, and you're bringing the mirror to hold. And you, wait, now look. I don't want to see the mirror. You see, we all have blind spots. And God may bring your parent, a friend, your spouse, even your enemy to hold the mirror up. You see, now it's, you're in college. When you become that, in quote, big man or big woman of God, are you going to be humble? Are you going to have a teachable spirit to be able to learn, even from a child? What is your attitude going to be to correction and advice? You remember when, Dan, um, when David sinned? When David, he murdered? First, he committed adultery, and then to cover his adultery, he now murdered the husband. You, he didn't have to be the one stabbing to murder. He planned the murder, right? And when Nathan, the prophet, came to him and confronted him, you know that David had the ability to lop off Nathan's head, that how dare you? How dare you? But when David said, you are the man who sinned like that, what did David say when Nathan told him that? He said, I have sinned. He said, I have sinned. What is your attitude now? You must have a teachable spirit if you are going to be characterized with God's presence. If you are going to be a leader in God's household for the long haul. So, when God holds up the mirror to you through people, how do you respond? Do you readily admit wrong? I'm going to speak to the men here because we often talk about male pride. When you get to that point when you get married and you have spouses, God would use your spouse. Your spouse is going to be the closest person to you. Sometimes your children to hold up the mirror to you. Are you going to be arrogant? Are you going to be self-conceited? You would miss what God has in mind for you. Be ready to admit your wrong. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. The Bible says humility and the fear of the Lord leads to riches, honor, and life. There's some Proverbs. I'm running out of time now, so I'll just ask you to write these Proverbs down. Proverbs 9, 8. It says, never correct a conceited man. He will hate you for it. But if you correct a wise man, he will respect you. Proverbs 10, 17. People who listen when they are corrected will live. But those who will not admit that they are wrong are in danger. And Proverbs 12, 15, stupid people always think they are right. But wise people listen to advice. Another point in, or with regard to inviting the presence of God is that you guard your heart with all diligence. What did I say? Guard your heart with all diligence. You see? The visionary entertainment world has Ravi Zacharias, he's, an, he's a Christian apologetic, as he put it, they are out to devastate your generation. They promise you pleasures that do not exist. You understand what I'm saying? Guard the gateways into your soul. What are you permitting into your soul through your eye gate, through your hearing gate? What are you permitting into your imagination? You have got to guard your heart with all diligence. You see, Daniel did it too. When Daniel drew the line that, I do not want the king's delicacies, he was drawing the line on what he will permit into his soul. When God tells us to draw the line against temptation and sin, are you one of those people who's like, let me dance as close to the line as possible. I'm strong. Yeah, I'm a trapeze artist. I can dance right here. Or do you draw the line far away? I don't want to touch sin. 
Let me draw the line far away. Be wise. David was regarded, was he, God is the one who said, he's a man after my heart, isn't it? But he fell. He fell badly. Let's not be presumptuous. Guard your heart. Second Timothy 2.22. I think that is a Bible verse that every young person should memorize. And as you grow, it will stay with you. What does it say? Thank you. Flee the evil desires of youth. Flee youthful lusts. And pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. There's the negative element, what you avoid. You avoid youthful loss. You run away from it like Joseph did. But then there's the positive element. You now pursue something. You pursue. You know what it means to pursue? Wait, let's say somebody, I don't know, most of you probably didn't go to boarding house, but if someone took something that's precious to you, maybe your younger brother when you are small, and they're dangling it and running, and you are in hot pursuit, eh? and you run after him. God wants us to be active in pursuing righteousness. Do you understand? You're deliberate, you're intentional, and you pursue righteousness, you pursue faith, love, purity, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You're so blessed to find Christ, to meet Christ in college. Pursue Christ out of a... My sister and I have a lifelong relationship. You can imagine the, the, going back. We have songs way back from 86 that we can sing, and most people that we know that will not know the, those songs. We have testimonies. Pursue Christ with those who call on the Lord out of a, a pure heart. And I'm going to be rounding up now. Two other characteristics of those, of, two other things that to welcome the Lord into your, pre, the Lord's presence to you is you're going to be someone who acknowledges who the wisdom comes from. Whatever gift, whatever special thing God is doing through you, you acknowledge that it comes from him. Daniel did that. You know when Nebuchadnezzar called him and he, when they brought, Ariok brought Nebuchadnezzar to interpret the dream, Nebuchadnezzar said, ah, oh boy, I hear say you can interpret my dream. Daniel said, there is no human being, there's nobody who can do that, but there's a God in heaven who can do it. Joseph said the same thing when they brought him to Pharaoh and they gave the glory to God. Even when God dropped the dream in Daniel's heart and the meaning, he gave praise and glory to God. I don't think any of you would ever start praising an iPhone or an iPad. Ah, you are so good. Ah, ah. I can open, I can call, I can using, be using the phone, I can go on the internet and be surfing, and you'll be praising the iPhone and ah, ah, this iPad is so good. Ah, you are really good. Oh. Nobody, none of you would do that. If one of your friends did that, you'd be like, okay. So God made you, God gifted you, God blessed you. You're not to praise that. Don't praise the donkey, you know? Let's not praise the donkey. Don't praise the iPad. It's the God who made you that needs to be praised. And that's what someone who is characterized by the presence of God will do. Last of all, that person would lead a life that causes others to praise God. So I ask you, what characterizes your life? What's the quality of your inner life? Because that's where it starts. Who are you when nobody is looking, when nobody is there? That's where it starts. We have Jesus has our example of servant leadership. He didn't lord it over. He said the kings of this world, what do they do? The leaders here, they lord it over those in that they are their subjects. He said it mustn't be so with you. He said, but the greatest in the kingdom, the one of you who wants to be the greatest, who wants to be the leader, that person should be the servant of all. And Jesus demonstrated it. He took off his robes, wrapped himself in a towel. None of the other disciples wanted to do it. If I can't walk with me and Peter, wash John's feet for where? But Jesus Christ wrapped himself with that towel. He stooped down. And that was the job of the lowest servant of the, you know, I mean, we said Joseph was in charge of the servants, right? In Potiphar's house. There was the lowest servant of all. The job of the lowest servant was to wash feet. And Jesus did that. And the towel with which he used to wrap himself, he was wiping those dirty men's feet, 12 men's feet. Have you smelled feet? <laughs> and Jesus did it. And he said, you call me Lord and teacher, and that's who I am. 
And if I, your Lord and teacher, did this, I serve you. That's what you should do for each other. So, let us choose. Let us choose the Lord. Let us choose the presence of the Lord. He will call you into the area, the sphere of leadership. But let what characterizes you be the presence of God. And as I close, let's take this song. If you know it, it's, it's a song we learned when we were kids. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rain came falling down. The rain came down and the floods went up. The rain came down and the floods went up. The rain came down and the floods went up. And the house on the rock stood firm. But the house on the sand fell flat. Right? The foolish man. What, is, what are the things they had in common? They both had houses. Right? They both built. They both experienced the storms of life the rain and the flood. What is the one thing they had that was different? Foundation. So they both heard God's word. Neither was ignorant of God's word, but the foolish man ignored what he knew. So it's not enough to know and hear. We all have to do. Amen? God bless you. Thank you so much. You're with you. Praise the Lord. Yeah, if you look at uh, the program, you see that my, uh, my name, we're actually two together in that panel. And I thank God for my sister, but I want to just uh, share one or two things from the point of view of BCF, you know, in, you know specific things that I think we should be do uh, doing. I do this because you guys know, you are leaders, so, you know, it's not something, it's not going to happen, it's already happening. Because as people in your school graduate, what do we do? We we'll invite you into leadership. Oh, I'm just a young convert. I got born again yesterday. No. We will trust you the way God trusts us. Amen? So it's good you pick up these strategies. Thank God for the principles that she has shared with us. But from the perspective of BCF, when we are looking for leaders, we are not looking for already made people. Amen? Yeah, we're not looking for people who qualify. Nobody qualifies in BCF because you haven't done any seminary education. You probably just got born again in the last Gethsemane experience. And your teacher, is, your, your president is graduating and they say, ah, who's? And then they give me your name. All I do is pray and then have faith. Amen? Because I can't, I can't go and hire somebody to come and be your president from outside. The president will have to come from the fellowship. So it means that you are a leader. Um, when, how do we appoint our leaders in BCF? We ask the current executive to make recommendations. So they give us uh, this bundle of names based on what they have, the trust they have developed leading you. So what's your relationship with your leaders is very critical. Um, they're not just going to open their eyes or, and, and nominate somebody they know is a troublemaker or somebody who doesn't have good foundation. The number one thing is that f f first, you are a student of the Bible. You, re you actually read the Bible. Can we all just stand up with me? You know I'm standing, and I'm older than you. <laughs> yeah, just stand up. Because I see, I see uh, tiredness, and I know why you're tired, and I feel it. I was rubbing my stomach a few minutes ago, and somebody <laughs> said, somebody say, why are you doing that? I said, me too, I'm a human being. <laughs> You know, so thank you all for uh, just enduring. And we're going to pray, then I'll br we'll break our fast, not in a, you know, in a distant time. <laughs> so, we, we get those names and we pray about them and we just say, okay, Lord, based on what we know about this person, it's usually based on the fear of God. We don't uh, assess you based on your uh, righteousness and holiness at the time. You may actually be making some mistakes, but if, if there is a, a trend in you that you love to do God's will for real, and that the will, his will that you already know, you are not contradicting them, 
We, are, we know you will grow. We trust you with leadership. So if we invite you to leadership, please don't say no. Amen? Don't say no. Um, a couple of things I want to share with you. Rally people, you, you, the certain principles in addition to what my sister has done. If you want to be a good leader in this ministry, in a campus where people are already upset and angry with Jesus, you must be somebody who knows how to rally people around yourself. You must be what? You must know how to rally people around yourself. You must not be somebody who repels people, who irritates people and make people angry. All right? And you can deal with anything in your life that repels people. Because if you are really going to marry and have a family, you need to learn how to live with people. In an era of iPad and computers and all that and all that, young people are becoming very, very isolated. They are working with machines and not with human beings. And that's unfortunate. We are created to be social uh, beings, not to the extent that we, f we fellowship and interact with our family members and the brethren, but not online and, uh, uh, or with, uh, with you know, those equipment. So we must be people who rally people around. Amen? They call them mobilizers. If you look at a scripture in First Kings, people must mobilize people. It's necessary to learn how to mobilize people. If you don't know how to do it, ask God to teach you how you can force people to come around. And there are several steps, several things you can do to rally people around you because this is the greatest problem we have. People start fellowships and nobody's coming and they are tired. Do you, want, do, you, do you want me to sit you down now? Okay, God bless you, sit down. Okay, number one, listen to the, I'm going to give you very quickly 22 steps, 22 things you must know in order to quickly bring people together. Write it down. That's why I said 22 of them. Make people feel that you really want them around you. Amen? You must be somebody who will make some people to feel that you really, really want them around you. You must have, number, that's number one. Number two, you must appreciate the people around you. Tell people that they're wonderful. Tell people that, you know, they, they're, they're hardworking. Tell people that they, 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 they are good looking. They are dressed well. You know, just compliment people. Learn how to compliment people. Some of us don't know how to, I don't know how to do it. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you how it is, whether you like it or not. <laughs> but I'm growing. Genuinely admire people's uh, everything. Genuinely. I mean, don't admire what is wrong. Uh, admire what, you know, if somebody comes in with a car and you like it, say, this is a wonderful you know, vehicle. Don't be envious and be like... <laughs> Houses and furniture. You know, just come, you know, learn to appreciate what people... If they have a nice hair, say, this is good. But don't, don't lost after that, guys. That's a different ball game. Number, I said genuinely admire people's cars, number on um, material things. Four, show people that you respect them, no matter who they are or what they have. Amen? Don't be seg segregated in your, in your admiration of people. A poor beggar can be admired. Be, number five, be conscious of people who have inferiority complex or complex and treat them carefully. Amen? We are living in a campus where people are angry and upset because of what's going on in their families. We must learn to respect people, even the homosexuals, amen? Respect them, love them, but don't love their sin. Don't accept that it's genetics. It's not genetics. They learned it in, their class, in the classroom. They learned it from their friends. They picked it up from the internet. They picked it, you know, different things than people say, oh, I am like this. You are not created like that, usually. You learn it from your friends. Somebody introduced you to it. Again, praise God, I am a geneticist, I have a PhD in genetics, and I can answer this question. <laughs> Amen. You know, somebody can actually call me, call me and say, I'm, 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 you, know, you know, they call people up and harass them. I am ready to be harassed. Number six, never tease someone who does not like being teased. Number seven, call people by their names soon after you have met them. 
Number six, never tease someone who does not like to be teased. We are talking to leaders on campus. You want people to come to your fellowship. You need to be very friendly. Number six, never tease people, someone who does not like to be teased. Number seven, I will, gi I will give it to you later because I want to get out of this place before they push me out. Okay? Listen, just listen to me now. Stop writing. You can get this later. Call people by their names soon after you have met them. That's number seven. Number eight, show interest in people's personal lives. Don't just be a Bible preacher. When, you, when they come to Bible study, you, you dish it out, you give it to them. Boom, 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 boom. And you turn around, you, you see them outside, you don't even recognize them. <laughs> like happens to me now. You know, I see all of you, I don't know who is who anymore. When we were small, I knew anybody, everybody by their names and middle names and everything. But now it's difficult. But in your small school fellowship, you can do better. Number nine, show an interest in people's aspirations, visions, and goals. The academics and other. Offer food and drinks to visitors whenever you can. We are so selfish these days that we don't give any, anybody anything. We only think about ourselves. If you're going to run a fellowship and be a leader, you must share what you have. Number 11, listen to people's problems. That's one of the greatest problems for us leaders. We don't like to sit down and just hear other people's problems. We will rather give them solutions without even listening to them. Let the conversation center around others and what they are doing rather than yourself. Be an encourager. Say thank you for everything. Smile. Amen. Yeah, smile. Just smile at people. Don't be angry all the time. Do not be partial. Don't treat people differently on your campus, in your fellowship. Don't segregate. You know, whenever there's an opportunity, give a gift. If you're a president here and you don't know the birthdays for every member of your fellowship, you are not doing well. You should have all their birth dates and, you know, cards ready at the beginning of the year to send to everyone. Signed by other members of the fellowship. Mourn with people who are mourning. When you hear somebody's uncle or brother or sister is dead, don't just say it's not my uncle yet. Go the extra mile to help someone. Amen? My homework, my this, my that. Sometimes people will come to you for money that you cannot afford. You know that. But tell the person, this is the little I have. Can I give it to you? Okay, don't dismiss it and walk away. I'm asking for $100, but you know, you're asking for $100, I don't have it, but I do have 50 cents. Can I, con <laughs> no, can I contribute that? And the person will say, yeah. It shows that you care. Be friendly. Greet people in a pleasant way. 21. Be concerned when listening to people's problems. You know you can be listening and not listening. Be very concerned when you actually listen. Notice when people are absent. Amen? When somebody does not show up for fellowship, just make an effort. Get out. Follow up on that. Those are some of the, 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 the things that I think I, I want you to take note of. And in order to be a good leader, you, may, you must stay ahead of the people you are leading. And there are five principles I give to you to stay ahead of the people you are leading. Otherwise, you'll be in the same position with them and you can't help them. Number one, have a daily quiet time. Have what? A daily quiet time. That's one way to keep yourself afloat, to make sure you are reading your Bible, you are praying, and that, you know, set time aside to meditate so that when they come, you actually have something to share. Number two, read the Bible every day. Have a daily quiet time. That's a time for meditation and reading the Bible. Then number two, again, I say read the Bible. What? Number three, pray every day, if possible, for hours. I'm not able to do that myself, you know, but I wish I am able and I want to be able. Every year, I actually resolve to do that. Pray every day. My wife prays for me all the time. Amen? So I thank God for her intercessory gift. Fast regularly. Fast, make a point to fast regularly. And number, that's number four. Fast regularly and learn things that are new. Number five says learn things that are new to you. Learn things that are new to you. That's number five. Don't just stay around what you already know. Keep on learning. That's how you stay above the people you lead. Amen. I will stop there. I have so much to say, but I can't continue now. Let me ask, does anybody have any question for Sister 
Sister, come. Let's see. Um, we have three minutes, and we are going to end now in three minutes. Any questions? If you don't have questions, that's okay, because we have, don't have time. Any one question about leadership? Okay, this is fulfilling all righteousness. <laughs> okay. Just shout it out quickly. The first thing I'll say is that you continue to walk in love towards that person. Keep in mind that not everybody liked Jesus. Remember that the Pharisees despised him, they couldn't stand him, but he was consistently who he was. And even them, he loved them. Jesus had the harshest words for the Pharisees because they were hypocrites. Because if you don't acknowledge your, your wrong or where you are in need, you can't be helped, right? But even them, he came to save even them. And so he walked in love with them, towards them. So you steadfastly walk in love towards these people, even though they don't hate you. You can't control another person's actions, but you can control your own attitude and actions towards that person. And you can, you can continue being kind. You can continue demonstrating the love of Christ. And when you're tempted, I mean, you will notice weaknesses about certain about people that you walk with closely and when you hear people start speaking evil you not only that you don't join in but you quench that so that you are demonstrating the love of christ I think Brad George would also have more. amen yeah what i do many people don't like me even some people here <laughs> what i do is i love people it's amazing when yeah, and, and, and uh, let's assume a scenario. She, I, I, she, she doesn't like me. She really, really hates me. And somehow, so one day she walks in into a room and I'm there by myself and all she's hearing is, Lord, Father, I thank you for Sister uh, Kemi Ogunson. I know it is well with her, Father, bless her. And I'm praying it from the depth of my heart. What do you think will happen? What do you think she will do? One, she will turn around and walk away. Okay, and go and reconsider everything she has believed about me. Are you hearing me? And I'm not, I wasn't doing it to please her. I was doing it because that's what I do. You pray for people, pray for those who don't like you, pray for your enemies. When you start doing like that, honestly, the Bible calls it a coal of fire. You heap a coal of fire upon your enemy when you're loving your enemy. They don't know what to do with you. It's, it's, they get confused. Do you understand me? And, you know, they can't handle it. So that's, the, we can't afford to hate. You can't afford to be upset as a leader. Jesus Christ forgave everyone that nailed him to the cross. Just at the point of they say, Lord, forgive them for they don't, they don't know what they are doing. Let's stand up and close. God bless you. And thank you so much. Stand up, stand up, stand up. Stand up, you pray. Again. Father, we praise you. O oh Lord Jesus, without you we are nothing, and we acknowledge this. But your word tells us, you said it, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will, and it will be done unto you. Lord, you are the vine, and we are the branches. Teach us, O oh Lord, to stay in you. Teach us, O oh God, to abide in you. Every one of us, we are children, no matter how old we are, no matter how long we've been in you, we are your children. Help us to be humble. Teach us, O God, to humble ourselves under your mighty hand. I pray for every young person here that, Lord, they will choose Christ daily, O God. They will choose you daily, and you will put them in the spheres of leadership you want them to be, and your presence will characterize their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you.